Yeah, I think the questions of organics, it's our knowledge will change the world. Um, and good ideas don't happen, they evolve. So, and I think economics will dictate what it looks like in the next 50 years. Um, the question about production, managing you know, land properly like what you're doing. And I was reading the other day, that's, uh, I think to, to run a business, any business now, since 2005 requires three times the amount of capital to, and that, just to get a, an animal to slaughter, it doesn't matter what business you're in, margins are the smallest that have ever been in our history. Like traditionally, we had big buy-sell margins in all industries, we don't have that anymore, so, and that's why we've got to look for those, those hard one percenters, everyone's looking for that silver bu bullet, and it, it, it doesn't exist, and that's what, what Rob's done, it's, yeah, it's pretty amazing, there's no right or wrong system, just do it properly. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so there was two questions there. The first one was about how to get started. Uh, and uh, really it's about trying to uh, focus on developing healthy soil ecosystems. Uh, and, the, and the sooner you get started on that, um, the sooner things will start to um, change a little bit in the way your system works and the easier it gets. Um, I, I, I think I mentioned in my talk back when we first started um, uh, we spent so much time just trying to keep our sheep healthy with our trenches and all that, but now we don't even think about it. It's not, not an issue. Uh, the second one was um, uh, how do you get time from the busy farming uh, business to actually become a marketer as well. Well, um, uh, it, there's a couple of things I'd like to say there. First off, um, I really believe that my slide that, that I said you don't get paid for growing food, you only get paid for selling it. So, um, and so if you, uh, there's a choice to be made. If you are a small retail farmer, um, the, the shorter your marketing chain is, the better off you're going to be. So, do, so there, there's a choice there. Um, we could grow more sheep on our farm, uh, for sure. Uh, but just at the moment, um, with our resources, we're spending more time marketing at a pace. Could I add? Yep. We've actually separated our businesses between our land management and a marketing and information company. So we've actually, that's what we've learned from our partners in New Zealand. So they have two different roles, uh, two different functions. And by actually making that separation has been phenomenal. It means we can specialise. I'm actually not good at sales and marketing. I like chasing cows. Um, and looking at grasses. So we, we actually have a full-time sales and marketing person uh, we have two girls part time do all our data, uh, do all our accounts, and and my hair's actually starting to grow back. <laughs> is that what I need to do? Is it? I guess that was how we. The thing why we did that was dealing with succession issues. So I didn't want to make the business dependent on the next generation. So it's, it's actually it's bloody exciting. We've got a sustainable business that's not dependent on any one person. Uh, it's dependent on a, you know, the, the concept, the vision. Uh, and the community, so it's yeah, it's a big step for us. But uh, yeah, as, as Julian talked about, that uh, learning partnerships, and that's one thing that you know we sort of tend to absorb. Those good ideas from people. Yeah, the thing I found most impressive about your operation is that you're doing this in conjunction with other countries around the world. So, and I actually think that's the way it's going to go. We're not just going to be you know little farmers in one valley. We're going to be we're going to have partnerships, knowledge partnerships and business partnerships all over the world. And that's, that's really going to change the nature of farming. Uh, I think our inputs are probably, because we're um, not cutting hay and silage, has really looked after our soils better, so that's probably the, uh, and we're, because we're early weaning, which actually drives our efficiency by about 50%, in terms of, it's a lot more, takes a lot more or less energy to, so, you know, when they're running separately, so we, we actually feed a grain supplement for 30 days. So that's, for us, that's probably our, our only major outside input. Um, but for us... No fertiliser at all anymore? Uh, we haven't done anything for a couple of years. I, I think what, our carbon's gone from 1% to 5%, uh, and it's really killed us this year because we're holding so much water. <laughs> um, so we don't actually do a lot of damage at the moment with our utilisation and soil structure, so we'll do a lot, we'll really reassess probably just a calcium point of view 
when it dries out to see what damage we've done. So, but, um, and because we're trading in, in and out a lot more too, we don't have as much any capital stock, we can really maintain that ground cover. And, and I think a lot of these conventional systems, the plants, the whole system becomes lazy. It's like, you know, we become addicted to chocolate and alcohol. I definitely see those systems become addicted to NPK. And once we get them off that drug and get the soil biology going, the chemical balance, they don't. Um, I mean, that's just what I see in the paddock, but we obviously have Matt, we keep monitoring it. He wants to sell me fertiliser, banks want to get plenty of money. So it's, good. it's a tough call over there. <laughs> Uh, we don't buy bags of fertiliser, although we do uh, put uh, micronutrients into the system at times if we think that there's signs that are telling us that's the case. Trace elements. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, but um, uh, we get our nutrient input into the farm from the, um, the amount, the little bit of um, excess feed we give to the chickens and the pigs in parts of the system. Uh, but um, we're also doing a bit of mining ourselves at the moment. Um, I don't think our nutrient input into the farm system is as big as what we're taking out. But because um, <coughs> our, um, I can't remember the exact figures, but um, our available phosphorus using one of the availability tests is about, that's very low, 12 or 15, our total phosphorus is 300. But, but as our soil ecosystem comes alive, that just seems to tap into that total phosphorus rather than just the available stuff. In the, in the long run, <coughs> We'll, um, we'll continue to bring feed on rather than fertiliser as the nutrient input in the ecosystem because that immediately gets turned into manure and becomes part of the ecology rather than a, a chemical in the system. Um, I, I did mention that in my talk. Cathy mentioned it very quickly right at the start. Our stuff isn't price sensitive at all. Um, we will set a price for tomorrow's farmer's market. There'll be Hopefully there's someone back there right now doing that. Uh, based on what income we want for the farm, okay. um, without being greedy. But so, so um, it's not a we don't take a market price. We set our own price, and because we're so connected with our customers, that's not an issue at all. It's not price sensitive. And I would confirm that on Saturday there's a queue outside their little fridge to buy their stuff, and it is first come first serve, and people pay basically whatever they're asked. I think the exciting thing from my point of view, like you've created two, you know, two new family businesses effectively. There's not many 400 acre or any businesses probably in your area that have created you know, enough job wealth for two more families. The flow on effect of communities is um, massive. The educational one is absolutely vital. I mean, if we have 8 billion uneducated consumers, they're going to murder agriculture. Um, I'm very encouraged, you know, this, this enormous um, wash of food programs that we've seen on television in the last five years. You can't turn your TV on without getting another bloody food guru talking to you. Those people are not putting over the sustainability message very loudly or clearly. Some of them are, but most of them are not. Most of them are just saying to people, Here's how to eat delicious, healthy food. And consumers are starting to get that. So consumers have been educated. I think Australia, most Australians could barely cook five years ago. And a lot of them, people who would never cook, are now playing around with it. And you know, every colour magazine you pick up is full of recipes and, and things like that. So there's a process of education about food going on in the wider community, which we need to capitalise on by adding the sustainability message. And this, this goes to setting the price. We need to set a sufficient price in the end that allows us to sustain the resources that produce the food. But that's not happening with the supermarket system. The farmers are not getting rewarded for looking after the landscape. So, so part of the educational process of consumers has to be around that. That when they eat, when they buy food, they choose foods that are going to sustain the farming system. And, and they move away from the foods that A will kill them and B will kill farming. Uh, but, but you know, there's going to be a lot of education in this space. But I, I think we can, we can change the educational curriculum as New South Wales farmers are trying to do. We can, you know, we can go with the Stephanie Alexander model of taking small-scale farming into schools and we can get schools more engaged in what we do. I think this is just something that humans will want to learn, but it's going to have to be pushed from agriculture. They won't, they won't just move it. And, and we can use the TV chefs. That's the other thing. TV chefs reach millions or even tens of millions of people around the world. 
and so they have great power. We need to get the ear of these people and the, you know, the Master Chef program and things like that so that they accentuate this. I'll give an example of New Zealand fishing program. They have this fishing program where you, know, you go out and catch as many snapper as you can. And, and, the, and in this program, the guy who caught all the, snapper, the, the most snapper did not win the show because he had fished unsustainably. But the guy who caught one big snapper won the, won the prize because he had fished and he put all the other ones back. And, and I think you know, once we start getting those kinds of messages about caring for our planet uh, across, they'll go down quite well and we'll make it a, you know, something that people can, can become joyous and enthusiastic about. I think that these two strands are going to come together. I mean, there's going to be a lot of push and shove, and there will always be different types of farming. Um, but, but I think, you know, especially if we have science operating at the interface of these two things. So the best ideas, whether they are high tech or, or organic or, or, or biological, are being tested out and validated. And then you can share the knowledge more widely. Once we know it works, let's share the knowledge. Um, if it's just on the say-so of a big chemical company or the say-so of, 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 of an organic belief system, you don't know if that's going to work for everybody. So we, we do actually, this is where we need to do more R&D, so that we know what works you know, in the long term, what benefits the land and the soil. Um, I, they're coming together closer and closer all the time. Uh, I, I think there's, um, there, uh, I agree with Julian that there's, um, we need to try to all sorts of approaches and support the mixing and melding of all those different approaches to try and come up with some answers. Um, the, the, um, the, the trouble is at the moment from an organic farming perspective that my science that, um, that I apply to my farm isn't, isn't chemistry, it's um, ecology. And um, that's sometimes a little bit harder to do um, very standard research with. About six or eight months ago, Queensland passed the world's first law protecting prime farm land. Now, it's never really been tested in the courts, but if you're a miner or you're a real estate developer, you actually have to show cause why you should take prime farming land out of agriculture. In other words, you have to produce an agricultural impact statement as well as an environmental impact statement if you're planning a subdivision. This may seem, this is going to be controversial because we're talking, you know, a lot of farmers hope to get their superannuation by selling the farm and things like that. But I think we probably are going to have to ring fence agriculture to protect, you, you saw what I said about the diminishing world soil supplies and the area of agriculture that's available. If we don't start passing laws, it'll vanish before we've even noticed it. I mean, here in Australia, we are spoiled. We still have enormous land resources, but that is not the case in China. It's not the case in India. It's not the case even in Europe and America. Uh, so I think this trend towards regulating where you can farm and where you can't probably is going to go ahead. But the, the urban agriculture I mentioned can actually absorb some of the pressure, some of the slack there, if we transfer some food production capacity to, um, you know. But different societies will solve the problem in different ways. Uh, I'd like to, just like to add to the list um, of uh, uh, food health and compliance, particularly from the meat processor perspective. Um, we <coughs> half our nutrients leave our farm with a sheep and then it come back. Uh, all sorts of reasons why it'd be much better to process on farm for us. Uh, all sorts of reasons and compliance is stopping us, the cost of compliance. Very briefly, just. just it is a trend as civilization becomes more and more populous, more and more people in the world, you actually have to have more regulations to control the mass impact. So, I mean, if you had no, no, no anti-pollution um, regulations in Australia, you would end up like China with everything being discharged into the river and everyone else having to drink it. So, you know, you would really end up in a bad place. So regulations are important. But on the other hand, when they get to the point where they're strangling an industry, the industry has to speak out with one strong, coherent voice. We, we've seen this a couple of times uh, under the Howard government, and there's an increasing trend now under the Gillard government, where the small business in Australia said, too much regulation, you're killing us. 
And um, you know, Canberra went back to the drawing board and they saw what regulations they could, they could remove. Um, if all you do is grumble about regulations, nothing will ever happen. But you need to speak through your farming organisations and demand, and you need to show economically how much these regulations are actually costing, how much they are adding to the price of a, of a trolley of food at the supermarket or something like that. You've got to show that everybody is being damaged by this thing. And then somebody will go and rethink those regulations, because there may be ways you can solve the problem without you know, a, a, a big rule book. You, know, you, may, you may be able to say, solve the problems with education and compliance, you know, education and, and, and self-discipline. Um, you know, self Okay, well look, uh, that operation in Queensland is not going to stop people starving in India or Africa, is it? To stop people starving in India or Africa, you need to give them knowledge that will enable them to lift their own agricultural production. Uh, that's the solution to their problem. Also, if you totally industrialise the production of, of, of agricultural produce and it becomes unhealthy, you know, there might be less to it than meets the eye if people are going to die of cancer or heart disease or stroke. So, you know, we actually do need to attend to the quality and the nutritional aspects of the issue at the same time. It's not all about volume. That's what I'm saying. I think a lot of the, the agricultural philosophy that has driven us for the last 30 years has been about volume, just getting more stuff out of the ground. Um, and, and we're now questioning, many people, farmers, consumers, are questioning whether that is exactly the right way to go. And I, I think you know that that's that, that's the. I think that in the end, agriculture will be the bit that supplies the real quality, the healthy food within our system. And underneath that, there'll be a whole lot of factory food, you know, which will be dirt cheap, but you know, not terribly interesting. You know, the quality stuff will come from farms run by people who care about how they produce things. Yeah. It's pretty sad, unless you're running ten thousand chooks, you can't have a you know, business to it like a chook. These businesses with a thousand chooks that are really struggling. So fundamentally, there's some, and it, it's really hard for young people in their prime, with a lot of energy and passion, and could be massive, you know, food producers sustainably, just can't get access to money. So all the wealth still sits 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 up in your generation effectively. And I've got lots, lots of friends in their, I've got lots of lots of friends in their thirties who just can't get access to capital to produce food. And whether that's government policy, um, I'm not too sure. It's there's nowhere else, there's nowhere in the world you'd actually own livestock and own the land if that's what you if, if that makes sense. So unless you inherit the land for some reason, but you can't. But no business can go and buy land and buy the livestock and make money. You can't borrow. So that's you've either got to own the livestock, run the business, and lease the land. There's only there's a place in Uruguay or Paraguay where you clear rainforest to make money by it, but that's a that's only small park in the world. So, so it's, it's interesting times. I mean, you've got two billion people who want to live like us in India. They want to have a car. You, you can't stop them living like us either. So, I don't know how you change values. You got two hundred million dogs in China that need to be fed. So, I don't know how we do that. <laughs> I think we actually need to change the image of food production quite a bit. I think that, you know society at large thinks of food production as rather old-fashioned and fuddy-duddy, and it's not helped by the fact that you know whenever there's a drought or a flood or something, Hanrahan's on the television saying, "Oh, geez, we'll all be ruined." You know, yeah. I I think we are on the brink of the most exciting phase in agriculture in the last ten thousand years. I mean, this is what we've been discussing here: all the new industries, all the new approaches. You know, the knowledge, the the, the opportunity to, to, to share knowledge and commodities all around the world, to market to your neighbours, to market to New York. Um, this, you know, and all of the, th the things that we're not farming at the moment, we might be farming. I think if you start telling that story about agriculture, bankers and other people who lend money or generate capital will start seeing this as a sunrise industry that they ought to get their money into and that it's got better chances you know, of lasting in the long run, say, with the mining sector or the banking sector, you know, because they're up and down like this, you know. I, I actually think that we need to tell a better story about agriculture so that the investors of the world see this as a, as a better bet. And it is a good bet. It's very, very reliable agriculture overall in terms of its return in the long run. 
But, you know, at the moment, I think a lot of people have a dark view of it, and, and we're probably not helping it by being a bit, you know, a bit down in the mouth ourselves about it. Uh, should uh, foreign ownership be monitored, or is that what you all be controlled? I don't like talking about politics, but I'm not scared, scared of it, but you're answer that wrong. Oh, I don't think I've got, uh, I've only got my opinion on that. Uh, I know that I've got lots of young students that are desperate to become farmers. And anything that drives up the, the amount of capital they need to get started is a negative as far as I'm concerned. So that's what I'll tell you what I told the Senate inquiry after this. Um, look, Australian agriculture has had foreign ownership since Colonel MacArthur. Okay? Um, there have been a lot of big companies and investors, mainly from Britain originally, and then from America, and latterly from Asia, um, coming into Australia at various times. If they were corporate enterprises, they didn't last. Most of them fell over within 20 years. Most of the really big pastoral operations and things like that have gone belly up. So big corporate enterprises don't last. They haven't got the staying power of the Australian family farm. That self-corrects. The worry, the worry is where you might sell a chunk of Australia to a company from, say, somewhere like China or some other country similar to that, Singapore, and that company is actually owned by the government. If you do that, then you are making a little piece of Australia for the person's argument to China. And they have the same rights to, to deal with that land as they deal with the Chinese embassy, which means that they can put spies in it, they can put military police in it, they can put soldiers and marines in it if they want to. So you're actually creating the situation where you could end up with a nasty argument. I mean, don't, those of you who remember the causes of World War II would know that there were major land disputes over the Rhineland, the Sudeten land, and the Danzig Corridor. We do not want to create a situation where we cede any of Australia's sovereignty to a foreign power. But if the companies want to come in here and try and compete with our farmers, well, then they probably won't do very well in the long run. Mm, gosh, no, no. Oh, and one more thing. We ought to be buying parts of China. Yes. Like Fonterra, the New Zealand dairy <coughs> company. They are taking their technology up there and, and showing the Chinese how to milk cows. Yeah, again, uh, just my opinion. Um, the, the workforce doesn't exist. The workforce to come in and manage a farm and run their own business exists everywhere. Thousands and thousands of people wish to be farmers, but um, not very many people want to work for $15 an hour or whatever it is, 10 hours a day. Uh, so maybe those questions sort of answer themselves in a way that if, uh, that if there's a trouble with uh, getting income on large scale farms, uh, getting labour on large scale farms, maybe those young farms could be smaller. Look, uh, I think when some of these exciting new industries get off the ground, you're actually going to be stampeded by people wanting to be in agriculture because it's going to be such an interesting place to be. It's going to be the next Silicon Valley, if you, if you look at it that way. And young people who want adventure will actually come into it. Um, you know, it's going to be a while before that happens, but I, I believe it will happen. Um, the other thing is that I don't believe all farmers should be forced to be commercial. You know, If they want to farm for a lifestyle and still produce a useful amount of food for the local community, then let them. There's no law that says that they have to make a profit. So I, I think we need to accommodate. We need biodiversity among farmers. You know? We don't want them all corporate, and we don't want them all very you know, hobby. But we want a very wide spectrum of, of production.